Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture, online at polarinertia.com, and Medivate, a community and set of tools to help you build the kind of meditation practice you'd like to have, online at medivate.com. Growing up in Orange County, what, what did Los Angeles look like from that vantage point? Well, you know, my first memories of Los Angeles are, are really driving up the five to see a Dodger game. Um, Los, and Los Angeles always announced itself through the downtown skyline. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty young, so I, I don't have memories of when downtown skyline was flat. Um, but it was always, uh, it's interesting you ask that because, um, you know, I, I'm, I grew up in Anaheim. Um, so, when people ask me if I'm a Los Angeles native, I don't really know what to say. I grew up in the Los Angeles metropolitan region, but the city that I grew up in and the county that I grew up in has an identity all of its own. This is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting down here in the McGuire Gardens at the Central Library in downtown Los Angeles with Nathan Masters, who writes about Los Angeles, especially the history of Los Angeles from the likes of KCET and Los Angeles Magazine. He writes as a representative, by the way, of Los Angeles as subject, an organization which is dedicated to preserving and telling the story of Los the stories of Los Angeles history, the histories of Los Angeles, however you want to put it, uh, which itself is based at the USC libraries. Now, First, you mentioned Anaheim. Was, was Disneyland just were you just sick of it by the end of childhood? Uh, not enough to uh, not get a job there. I, I worked there through high school and college. Um, what window did that give you into the sort of breakdown of people who go to Disneyland? Like locals, kind of locals, tourists from the world over. I imagine a mix of everything. It is a mix, mix of everything. I think the majority, just based on my experience, the majority are, are people are locals. They're people in the, who live in the area um, who visit. As in Orange County? As in Orange County, uh, the greater Los Angeles area, too. Uh, they, they might visit, you know, mo- most of them have annual passes. They probably visit uh, several times a year, even not several times a month. How do you describe, I've, I've tried many times to describe the relationship of Orange County to Los Angeles, because we were just chatting about these books that lump it in books from the 60s and 70s and 80s in Los Angeles that essentially treat it as the backyard of Los Angeles or part of Los Angeles. Might as well be. Just throw it in there. But growing up there, did did you get the sense it was protective of its own identity as well? Yeah, and I, I think I, I think that's gone back and forth. I think Orange County has gone back and forth on how it wants to see itself. Um, you, you know, in, Inverse to the fashionability of Los Angeles? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean... Orange County used to be part of Los Angeles County until it was 1888 or 1889 when it seceded. It split off from from Los Angeles County. It was all one county. Now, Anaheim was actually the second city to incorporate within Los Angeles County um, sometime in the 1860s or 1870s. Uh, And at the time, it's it's a fair question whether Anaheim was a suburb of Los Angeles or whether it was its own settlement. Um, you know, there was no rail line connecting Orange County and Los Angeles at the time. Um, I think it was a, a stagecoach or wagon ride between the two cities. Uh, and that's part of the reason why Orange County wanted to split. It was just seen as so isolated. But eventually Los Angeles grew uh, and it incorporated all these communities that had existed for decades. So growing up, Los Angeles was a place to go for a Dodger game or more? Uh, I mean, it was it was more. It was uh, Los Angeles was the city. It was, but it wasn't the city in the same way. Somebody living in the East Bay refers to San Francisco as the city. Um, you know, I, I didn't I didn't feel like there was any sort of uh, cultural attachment between the two counties. And you know, the Orange County Register existed. Orange County had its own, still has its own paper. The Los Angeles Times tried to make a dent in that. They opened their Orange County edition. Uh, never really uh, caught on. I think Orange Countyans, um, I don't know if I just coined that term. <laughs> I was going to ask, is that the demonym? Orange Countyan? Orange Countian? I've heard people say that, but I think Orange Countyans are pretty proud of of their own separate identity. I mean, just look at what happened when the, the Angels renamed themselves the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. There was a, a full-scale rebellion. When did you become interested in Los Angeles? As w- I, I would Let me frame it this way. 
If you had an interest in Southern California already, when did an interest in Los Angeles as well manifest itself? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think it just sort of came about. Yeah, I, I, the more the more I studied Los Angeles, I mean, the more I studied Southern California, California, Los Angeles is the the just the natural place to gravitate towards. I mean, it's the the biggest city. It's the most Southern California city in Southern California. So if you want to if you want to learn more about Southern California, you have to study Los Angeles. The most Southern Californian city in Southern California. I guess we should break that down a bit. Sure. Well. In Southern California, uh, well, well, first of all, it's the largest city in Southern California. Um, the you know most of the businesses, um, cultural organizations, uh, are are headquartered there. At least if you're excluding San Diego, I know Southern California. Nobody really sh is sure what that means. I was going to ask, <laughs> is San Diego? That seems a pretty Southern California place as well. It is a pretty Southern California place, and Almost it's cartoonishly Southern Californian <laughs> at times. That that's true, uh, and it, it's sort of in its own uh, orbit. It's not it's not a satellite city of Los Angeles. In fact, there's a rivalry that goes back all the way to the 1860s, uh, 1870s, when uh, the Southern Pacific pitted the two cities against each other. Um, uh, basically, the the railroad threatened Los Angeles. They, they, they said to Los Angeles, "If you don't." Uh, pay this ransom. We'll route our trunk line down to San Diego and bypass Los Angeles, killing the the city's economic hopes. Um, <laughs> but you know, Los Angeles is um, incredibly diverse. Uh, Southern California is, as a region, diverse. But Los Angeles in itself, um, really diverse. All these um, there are ethnic enclaves all throughout the city. Um, and if you're looking to condense the subject of Southern California into one city, there's no better place to look than LA. The guest I talked to last time on the show was an Englishman who moved here in the mid-90s, and he was working on a book about a Los Angeles architect, also an Englishman, and he said the more he learned about Los Angeles and the original intentions of Los Angeles, the better he could live here. Does that ring a bell with you, that sentiment? How far back are we going? Are we talking about, uh, are we, you know, are we talking about the city's founding in 1781? Are we talking about the Mer American reinvention of the city after the conquest in the Mexican How far back do you think you go before the under before knowing the history stops helping you understand the modern place well i don't know that you can stop i think uh you you, you have to look at the the indigenous people who lived here before the spanish came you have to look at the uh, you know at the, at the geography of the of the place before even the, the the first people came to north america um i mean there was a there, there's an ancient a uh, trail that is approximated today by Wilshire Boulevard that led between, well, that, that led between the Cajon Pass um, near Rancho Cucamonga and the sea. It passed right by the La Brea Tar Pits and, you know, many Pleistocene elephants or mammoths uh, were led to their deaths on that trail. Right. And today, you know, people still drive and walk that, that path every day. Not the exact path, but... Does this, you think, hold true for any place, not just Los Angeles, not just Southern California, but you're always going to get more of an understanding if you go back, back as far as you can into history, or is something about here, does something about the history here give you the, a, an edge, an edge on understanding what the city is today? No, I, I, I think that's probably true of, of any city in the world. Um, you're you're going to understand the city, the place better, if you understand what was there before it was a human place, when it was um, but before people lived there. When did you begin learning, not professionally, but just the point when you started digging for information on Los Angeles? Well, I, I mean, that was that was many years ago, and I started reading some of the great books that people have written about Los Angeles. You know, Mike Davis's City of Quartz, um, Bill Deverell's uh, Whitewashed Adobe. Um, you know, when those books were when those books were new. Um, but se seriously digging into the history. Uh, I started doing that uh, just a few years ago when uh, KCET asked me to start writing a regular series on behalf of Elliot Subject, which maybe I should explain that that's a, a research uh, alliance hosted by the USC libraries made up of uh, museums, libraries, official archives, private collectors. Um, and I was asked to write a weekly series that sort of tells a story about Los Angeles history around a collection of photos that, that we highlight. Now, when you picked up those books at first, The City of Quartz or Whitewashed Adobe, what, what do you remember as being particular insights that motivated you to want to know more or ways they framed the history of this place? Hmm. 
Well, four questions they asked, actually, now that I think about it. Right. Well, I mean, you go back to, to whitewashed Adobe, um, and it, I mean, one of the most startling things that I read was was when, when Deverell said that calling Los Angeles, calling Mexican Los Angeles, the, the, the city that existed before 1847, a sleepy little village, as many, uh, many books about Los Angeles did and still do today, um, is basically a slur against the city. Um, it, you know, it was a rationalization of the American conquest. Um, it was too sleepy. We had to take it. <laughs> exactly. And, and there was this, this thought, uh, this pervasive thought that, that um, Spanish and Mexican, uh, the Spanish and Mexican um, residents wasted the land. They, they wasted this paradise. They didn't, they didn't um, make the land fruitful as the Americans later did. That's the, the sort of narrative that was anchored by that, that slur. So what do we know about what was going on in Mexican Los Angeles if it wasn't as sleepy as we've been led to believe? What, what was it? Well, I mean, it was founded as an agricultural settlement. I mean, it does, it, like most cities, it has modest origins. It was, it was um, founded in part because the, the Spanish governor of, of California uh, wanted, to, uh, wanted a civilian settlement to balance the, uh, the religious missions that had already been established. Um, he feuded with uh, Father Sarah, um, and it was also... Uh, supposed to provide food for the Presidio in, in Santa Barbara. Um, you know, the, you know, the soldiers needed a reliable source of food outside of the mission farms, which were rather productive and actually profitable. Uh, so it had its modest origins, um, but you know, the city, the, the city was growing. The city had a character. There were there were people who lived in the city who had their own um, desires and their own goals, and um, you know to. To just ignore them through a slur by calling it a, a, a sleepy town, uh, it just isn't fair to them. It's one of the, people will think about it, they hear they'll hear a story like that and they'll think well, how much of the how much of that survives in the Los Angeles of today. I mean, you have certain tributes to it. You have a lot of immigration that has come from Mexico since, but is that a core completely overwritten by the Los Angeles that came next? I mean, you can always talk about uh, which Los Angeles were replaced the previous one, can't you, throughout history? Well, I mean, I don't know if you can say that one Los Angeles replaced another. I mean, it's a, it, Los Angeles, like all other cities, is always in a state of change. So there's, the city has changed and grown. And yes, the Los Angeles of today, of course, is unrecognizable, would be unrecognizable to somebody who lived here in 1840. Um, but, you know, there are, I mean, within our, the, the physical city, there are still uh, remnants of, of, Los Angeles of the 1820s. I mean, the the plaza, which it's not the original plaza because flooding forced the settlers to move it uh, once or twice. Um, but the plaza that was reestablished in the 1820s and the, the plaza church, it's still there. Uh, Angel's Flight, uh, you know, a symbol, uh, you know, a symbol of the, uh, you know, industrial, uh, industrial prowess of the city of the early 20th century. Uh, that's that's still there, although. I think it's temporarily uh, closed. Is it closed right now? It it, it is. There was a uh, oh, there was another accident, was wasn't there? Yeah, yes. thankfully nobody was hurt. Right. Um, but I, I you know I love the fact that that railroad's still there. That real, yeah. um, it, it seems like it serves no no practical use. Although I did a uh, I did a video on this for KCET, and we asked I was I asked the operator uh, John Wellborn, you know why do people use it? And I expected him to say, well you know it was. It's an it's a novelty railroad. People just use it um, when they're visiting in town or to, they're showing their friends. But, but no, he says that a majority, seventy percent of the people who use it, um, use it as part of their daily commutes. And I actually have friends who've who've confirmed that. Um, I have one friend who works on you know one of those steel glass towers on Bunker Hill, and in one of the California plazas. Yeah, somewhere around there, and he takes it down almost every day to visit Grand Central, Grand Central Market. That's there, there are quite a few steps there. You get tired. If yeah, you have to carry something, you know. It's, I, I cannot. But it's still. It's not that. It hasn't been totally. Because you can think about it in a couple different ways. I mean, of course, it's moved what half a block away from its original location. It used to lead to Bunker Hill, a residential neighborhood. People. People. It used to be a purely utilitarian thing people used. Right now, it's just a mostly utilitarian thing. I can't. It's hard to imagine. It's. It still seems like it's a bit. 
the people I write it still seem to be treating the people I write it with when I'm on it still seem to treat it as as a novelty, but an exciting one. People like it. Right. I think it might depend on when you write it. Um, if you write it during the morning rush hour, uh, there might be. I mean, no, nobody. It's such a short ride; you never have a chance to get out a book or a newspaper. Yeah. Um, and so you're going to be, you're going to be looking around and and um, trying to take in whatever whatever you can from the experience. Um, but you know, I, I think probably the reason why it was rebuilt um, was because of people like John Wellborn. You know, they they see it as a symbol of the past, and uh, to their credit, they pushed really hard to, uh, to bring it back. The CRA eventually brought it back. I think it was in the in the 90s. People do write about Los Angeles as having been uniquely unconcerned with its own history for a long time, and we seem to have come out of that. But do you think that period, there was that period where Los Angeles as a whole cared less about its history than some places? Well, that's a good question, because I, I mean, you even hear people today say Los Angeles... Or, or, or they at least say that people say that Los Angeles has no history. Several degrees away from the source at this point. <laughs> exactly, and I don't, I don't really know what that means. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, there's there's always there's this cliche about Los Angeles that it's a city where you come to reinvent yourself or to forget about the past, but the city here has a past, um, and it's always informed the the present. I mean, what, what do you th- what do you think that means? That, what do I think it means that? The, the sort of line that people don't care about the history in Los Angeles? Well, it seems like when I read, when I'll read the same books I'm referring to before, you know, ones from the 20th century, they'll, they'll be making the, a point about how Los Angeles, about how Angelinos are always talking about next year, next decade, 20 years from now, oh, what the city's going to be. And I guess that, they see that mindset as having been to the detriment of Understanding what the city came from. I don't know if one necessarily takes away from the other, but it does seem like there were periods where Los Angeles was very focused on pushing specifically forward, right? Sure. I mean, but even if you go to say one of those one of those moments where LA was was looking forward, the the building of the the aqueduct or the the campaign uh, to pass the bonds that finance the aqueduct. Uh, you know, I mean, the city was looking back at its past and, and pointing to periods of drought, um, point, uh, pointing to its water sources. I mean, they, um, they, they sure they were looking forward and saying, you know, we um, we project a population of this amount. Our water supply isn't going to sustain that. But there was always, even at those, you know, moments of those pivotal moments where LA was looking forward, they were looking back to. Sometimes I'll talk to native Southern Californians who are interested in the history of Los Angeles and of this half of the state, uh, and they'll say that they their interest was really galvanized by having spent time away from Southern California. Is that true for you as well? No, you know what, I've I've lived in Southern California uh, almost my entire life. You know, with the so you, didn't, you didn't need that, that uh, Amish-style year where you're away, <laughs> and you, it was actually the interest was already there, because often they'll say yeah, like a lot of Native Angelinos, I didn't know really. I didn't really know what I didn't really appreciate what was here, or I just took it for granted that I didn't realize how it was different from other places. But for you, did you already have that sense like this is an interesting place? This is this is unusual, even though you came up here. Sure. I mean, I even think about maybe it's 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 just me. You know, I've always had an interest in in what's been here before me. I mean, I remember. Uh, you know, I'm sure that that lots of other little little kids did the same. But when I was playing in my uh, my front yard. As a child, I remember uh, digging in the ground and thinking I'd find, I don't know, you know, bones or buried treasure or, or whatever. But can I, can I picture a classic Orange County front yard? Just a total, total uh, vision of childhood suburbia. Uh, pretty much, yeah, yeah. A big, a big lawn. There was a, there was an olive tree that looks a lot older than it is. I mean, the house, um, you know, the house is probably about 50 years, 40 or 50 years old now. The, the truth is, though, that. You know, I was always aware of the specific history of my my childhood home, um, where my parents still live today. Uh, you know, it was in Orange Grove. Uh, it, my my parents or my my uh, family moved in just as it was a, a newly constructed house. Um, it, it had the Orange Groves had been torn down. But when my family moved in, my father moved in as a boy and then later purchased the house and he's living into it, living in, uh, there today. Uh, next door, uh, the Orange Groves continued. And it was several years before the Orange Groves uh, were torn down and the, the tract was extended. And it was I, right up against the oranges that gave the county its name. Ex- uh, well, there's question as to what, whether the, uh, the orange actually gave Orange County its oh, name. 
Um, there's a there's a big debate, and I don't really want to get in the middle of that. But you know, there was a day without, without taking aside what what yeah. does it what does the issue hit the rocks over? How does it this how does this break down? Some people think it was oranges. Some people think it was well. I, I don't think it's a debate of any consequence, <laughs> uh, which is really why I don't want to wade into it. Um, you know, there are some people who say that it was named after. Uh, you know, William of Orange, or some people who, who do say that it was named after the fruit or an anticipation of the fruit, or, or it, the name suggested that oranges could grow there. Oranges probably already did grow, but they weren't as common as they were, well, when I was growing up, when you drive down the five freeway through South Orange County and there were orange trees everywhere. I see. But back, back to my, my parents' house, there was a day when the bulldozers came, and my grandfather actually, uh, he had great, great foresight, he, he took out his 8 millimeter film camera, and he... Um, he stood up on top of the house and and filmed the the bulldozers going. They just went to from one tree to another, picking it up by its roots, dumping it down. Eventually, they gathered them into a heap and burned them. Did you got you get footage of the burning heap of orange he trees? Did, yeah, wow. it's dramatic footage, especially because there's no sound. You know, it has this really eerie <laughs> post-apocalyptic quality to it. Right, right, right. So this, you you saw how you saw how. A part of Orange County was built then. They're on film. You, well, at least the, the precedent for building, which was taking down the trees. Exactly. And, the, you know, the vast vast parts of uh, the San Gabriel, San Gabriel Valley are the same. If you drive down the 210 uh, today and you look, if you're driving east and you look to your left, um, you know, all those suburban neighborhoods were once orange groves. There's that, that belt of, of orange groves that's stretched all the way to Riverside, San Bernardino counties. Now, that's something people vaguely no usually it's like yeah, this used to be all agricultural you can just look around at the houses and you can say yeah, that, that was all trees of fields orchards what have you but a lot of what you write about for KCET or for Los Angeles Magazine seems to have the premise of like here's something you would not have known about here's a surprise for you from the history of Los Angeles whether it's there was a, a bicycle freeway in Pasadena for a little while or there was a snowstorm is that something you want to do just to to find a historical surprise that's exactly right I mean what, what I'm trying to do is is I'm just trying to make history accessible I'm trying to make people interested and excited about it and I you know I think one of the best strategies is to is to surprise people it's not exactly a hey did you know did you know this happened but that's the, that's a part of it isn't it it's a part of it I mean another part of it is it, it sort of challenges assumptions um, the cliches about the city what, what for are some of the cliches you, you like to challenge best in your writing <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there are, well, I, you know, there, there are several myths about the city that, um, that I like to challenge. I don't know if, I've, if, if I challenge them face on. Sure. Um, you know, I think, I think one of the most pervasive myths is that Los Angeles is a desert city. Oh, um, and that's actually addressed in a wonderful article in the current issue of Boom, Mag uh, Boom Magazine from California. Uh, you know, Los Angeles gets 15 inches of rain annually on average, which, in, in fact, it fluctuates wildly. But, you know, we're, we're in the same um, climatic league as, as Rome or Athens. We're not, you know, there's nothing inherently unsustainable about right. a big city in this climate. Um, you know, the, 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 and the, there, if, if you go back to all this writing about Los Angeles, there's, uh, there are so many people who... who uh, prophesize that Los Angeles will one day revert to sagebrush and cactus yes. and well, what was the appeal of this idea that Los Angeles is in a desert and barely hanging on just by the by the strength of water theft it's 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 just <laughs> hanging it's hanging by a ledge well I mean I think it I think uh, in part it's sort of the inevitable response to the the booster narrative that Los Angeles is this paradise um, and I I mean, you see that with a, with a lot of with a lot of things. There, um, the, the aqueduct is one. Um, you know, the aqueduct is shrouded in the, the origins of the aqueduct are shrouded in this controversy, which you know, a lot of it comes from Chinatown. But there's a lot of sort of collective guilt that predates Chinatown. But you see that with um, the loss of the of the the streetcars too, mm -hmm. the dismantling of the streetcar network. Um, and again, there's another film that that sort of encapsulates that conspiracy theory and uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, but you know the the streetcar network was aging when it was dismantled. People were unsatisfied. I've never heard somebody say like, "Well, that was so great." When there were the red cars going nine miles an hour through downtown. Exactly. Yeah, they were. Uh, they had to share the streets with automobile traffic. They were uh, traffic traffic choked streets. And I say this um, as someone who doesn't have a car, by the way. So I do use public transit here, but I don't. I don't pine for the red cars or the yellow ones, for that matter. 
No, I mean, what Los Angeles, actually what transportation planners had, had called for since the 1920s was rapid transit, which uh, would, have, would have been subways or elevated trains or even monorails uh, to separate the trains from street traffic. Right. And finally, in the 1990s, Los Angeles built a subway. Right. You know, seven well, years after. <laughs> and still slowly <laughs> making a progress. I mean, I'm happy it's making progress, no doubt. But, yeah. Um, I, but on that subject, you know, I, I hear plans for, say, we're sitting here downtown. Yeah. I hear plans for the downtown streetcar. So you get this echo of this echo of what streetcars were back then, but also echoes of the problems. Like, I hear that won't get its own lane. It's like, okay, well... We tried, I guess. Right. Yeah. I don't. I. I don't know what to make of it. I. Yeah. You know. I'm. 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 Hopeful for it. Right. Um, you know. It, it, the supporters of the streetcar point to places like Portland, where they right. say that you know revitalized. What is it? The Pearl District there. Yeah. Um, it's still very slow. I've ridden that streetcar. Well, maybe the point isn't isn't transportation. It's. Uh, um, that's, that's fair enough. I mean, that is a Los Angeles concept as well. It's not just about utilitarianism it's about i mean i remember ray bradbury writing that if you want anybody to get rapid transit built here i think he said it in the 50s i liked walt disney mayor because he can he can sell it you know that's there's los angeles as a city that had to be sold hard initially it's, there's still that element and everything needs a little bit of a, a little bit of a pitch here doesn't it seem whether built in or an actual pitch yeah it does um and i mean that that's that's true if you go back through history too. I mean, if you look at the, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about the aqueduct a lot because I just read that that, that issue of Boom. But uh, I'm trying to think of other, yeah. I mean, for for instance, the first, um, and this is covered in the uh, the, Never, the Great Never Built exhibition at the oh, yes. Architecture and Design Museum. Uh, but the, the first proposal for rapid transit was doomed because, well, because the Los Angeles Times opposed it, and they they conjured up images of of dark and dangerous. Elevated trains soaring overhead, um, following onto onto crowds of, of pedestrians below. Why did they have uh, why why did they have such enmity for it? I guess where does that come from? Because I I understand that's the story about them defeating it, but why did they hate it? Hmm, that's a good question. That's one of these. It's a question I have a lot in Los Angeles history. As you can hear, you hear a lot of these stories, and I wonder like why did pe why were people for or against the things they were for or against? You know, sometimes it comes down to that, and you don't have the answer sometimes. Right, right. I mean, you'd have to look at you know the the times in the twenties was still the domain of the of the Chandlers, and they had their clear interests. And if they wanted to, I mean, I'm sure they did steer the paper uh, to oppose to oppose that that plan. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. You'd have to. You'd I wonder really why they would to, care. Did they have like a lot of stake in auto builders or something? I don't know. I mean, I wonder if uh, you know. Maybe if you ask Mike Davis, uh, uh, he might say that it challenged the supremacy of the, the downtown business interests, which the Chandlers represented, uh, where the Chandlers were, in part, the downtown business right. interests. I'm, I'm glad you bring up Mike Davis again, because you mentioned, of course, the book City of Courts earlier, one of the most read books on Los Angeles still, and it's like 25 years old at this point, but certainly not a book boosting Los Angeles. It's it's very much part of the counter-narrative. You, you know, there's, there's the boosting that had to go on early on with Los Angeles when it, when it was expanding in the early 20th century. Just straight up, not nuanced boosterism. And then it gave rise to a counter-narrative. I, I won't say City of Quartz is not nuanced, but it definitely is affected by that. It and books like it, there's, there's, there are statements made about Los Angeles that are that seem to be shaped by just needing to balance the boosterism. Like, mm -hmm. we can be a little more negative than we need to be because it, people were too positive before. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I mean, I, I wondered, do you, what's your impression of, of noir, do you think, mm. or of, of, you know, Chandler's novels? Do you right. think that's a response to that booster narrative? I, you can't help but think that, can you? Because it's these, I mean, in my memory, the films and the novels make Los Angeles so dark. I don't know whether it was because of the sensibility of those creators and Los Angeles was their setting, or maybe they had the darkness within them and thus were drawn to Los Angeles. But we, and this is something I talked about with Richard Rayner, the novelist, a few weeks ago, which was our strange need in Los Angeles to tell dark stories about this place, its origins and, and such. And I don't want to hear nothing but I don't want to have a lot of uh, fake, uh, fake, uh, pleasant stories told to me. But at the same time, you know, nor do the polemics 
the polemics on either side aren't really interesting. I mean, really, mm. what's interesting is the actual history, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, I, I want to go back to... Uh, we were talking about Chandler. Yeah. Uh, 1939, wasn't that... I think that, that one year, uh, Day of the Locust came out, Ask the Dust, yes. and... Um, and now I'm blanking on the Chandler's first uh, Philip Marlowe novel. Yeah, the, the big, uh, the big long, sleep. The, yeah, the big yeah, sleep. Big sleep. Yes. Right. Those all came out in the same year. I wonder what's what was so special about 1939. But those were all books that that um, did depict Los Angeles in some way as a as a you know dark and guilty place to oh, yeah. <laughs> Rainer. And 1939 also seems to be acknowledged as Hollywood's best year ever in terms of the the. Uh, the financial supremacy it had, and just the, the the amount of pull it had in the culture, and we haven't mentioned, of course, there was film production here, and there it was it was uh, it was there then as well. Uh, 1939 was very much the hooray for Hollywood year, but also the year where uh, the need to gaze upon the underbelly seemed to be the strongest. I don't know if those are related, but it's pretty it's pretty tempting to frame it that way, right? No, that is, yeah. And it's an interesting point in the city too, because you know, a couple years later. Everything shut down. World War II. Um, hmm. It's an interesting thought. And what does it feel like to live here in downtown Los Angeles, which is a place you would just see as an icon as a kid, go yeah. past to get to Dodger Stadium, and I would assume never had a reason to go for a long time. No, no, we didn't. I mean, the the we closest were advised against going probably many times. Probably, yeah, no, no. We we uh, the closest I ever got to downtown Los Angeles was you know Exposition Park or Dodger Stadium. Um, neither are close by standards of another city. No, no. Uh, neither qualifies as... I hear people refer to USC as downtown, but it's just not downtown Los <laughs> yes. Angeles. Uh, no, but today it's 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 great. I mean, it has what I'm, at least at this stage of my life, what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a, you know, a walkable neighborhood with lots of things to do within short distance. I, you know, I live a block away from the Ralph's Grocery Store and a Target, which you know, all my day-to-day -day needs are taken care of and uh, friends who live in the area. It's a... It's a fun place to live right now mm. and it's definitely it definitely seems to be on the rise do you think you're watching a transformation in los angeles equal to some of the transformations throughout history you know you can point to any decade and you can find a couple of a couple of transformations of los angeles can't you or at least one per decade like one decade to the next in los angeles history no matter what decade you're looking at quite a bit of change aren't you Oh, sure. I mean, the city never stands still. Right. People talk about not having liked the 90s very much, but still, <laughs> big, things, things were built, things happened. I mean, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to line up the periods of Los Angeles history in my head, and I, I, I do wonder, do you find, when you're writing about surprises, historical surprises, as we say, are any much more fruitful than others, or can you just pull from whatever? I notice much of what you write about is indeed from the early 20th century or the 19th century, mm -hmm. but is that just because the older something is, the less someone's likely to know about it, the more they'll be surprised, or is there really, is there really just more surprising stuff? I mean, 19th century America was a weird place. Sure. I, I think you're right. That's part of it. It's just so removed from our our present time that, yeah, you're, you're more likely to find things that people would think are weird. Um, like for instance, the Pasadena Cycleway, the, uh, yeah. uh, basically a freeway built for bicycles. Now, that's surprising for a number of, a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, you know, it was a, um, well, first of all, it shows that it's proof that there was this huge craze for bicycles, uh, for bicycling, which, uh, you know, is now resurgent today. I mean, there's a there's at least a huge movement for for bike lanes. For the Sunday Ciclovia is happening. Exactly. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but secondly, I mean, it's just the, the audacity of that proposal. I mean, it, it was never built, and I don't know if it would have ever been built. Um, they I think, didn't even get a little prototype chunk at all. They, no, the, yeah, they, there was a, a about a mile and a quarter right. stretch of it was that was built, but it was, it was supposed to be a 10 mile route linking right. Pasadena to Los Angeles, and I mean that would have been expensive. It would have been costly to maintain. Essentially, like the freeway, the, the actual freeway we have. Yeah, actually, uh, parts of the Arroyo Seco Parkway um, use the original right of way. Uh, and parts of the gold line too, I believe. Right. It's, you know. These are these are some of the layers, listeners. You can see happening. It, it's that brings up something else that I I think people could benefit from knowing historically about Los Angeles. The Arroyo Seco Parkway is not designed to be driven at 65 miles an hour, isn't it? <laughs> Yet they insist on doing it. Yeah. No. That's, they knew. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think people who have the uh, the right cars can pull it off. 
but I wouldn't advise it. Um, no, that's it's uh, especially if you're if you're trying to enter the freeway midway. Those uh, those short on ramps. Uh, uh, that's a white knuckle experience. That's yeah. for sure. Uh, no, no. I think the original speed limit was 45, and I remember um, when I was doing some research on the Parkway. Uh, you know the the police. It might. I don't know if there was a California Highway Patrol then, but the the police uh, officers who were patrolling that um, they made a point to talk to talk to the reporters and say, you know, we're going to str- um, strictly enforce this 45 mile per hour speed limit. Uh, it is in. It does. It, it is tempting to drive a little faster and test your car's limits, but uh, it's not the best thing to do. I imagine the cars driving on it when it opened, not all of them could easily get up to 45 miles, miles an hour. So I'm picturing like the jalopy that uh, uh, Arturo Bandini's girlfriend in Ask the Dust drove. You know, it's, it, it could, she could floor it and it still couldn't, didn't quite get up there. But right. that's something people, I think, in the rest of America might be surprised by. That's a road they could go on. And they'll get the sense that they're in they're on something historical because they'll feel like this is an old freeway like we don't have old freeways in other parts of america do we that's that's was that one of the first freeways built in in america or? you know that there were it, it wasn't the first there were um east coast cities that had built um you know grade separated um parkway or free highways like that standing um, today still uh, you know what? I don't know. I haven't looked into that. It, you know, it wasn't even the first really in Los Angeles. Um, there, there was something called the Ramona Expressway. Uh, it was actually originally just called Ramona Boulevard. I don't think anybody really knew what to call it. Right. But um, it was essentially a freeway. It was uh, great separated, so meaning that, that cross traffic was either was on overpass the bridges or, or they went below the, the roadway. The only thing that made it not technically a freeway is that there was no center divider. In fact, there might not have, have even been any lane markings. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, David Reef's book on Los Angeles is called uh, Capital of the Third World, and that, that that's a, I think I've seen that in the, thir- in the Third World, and no lane marking, no divider freeway was ahead of its time in, in that <laughs> sense. But when you have somebody visiting who doesn't know much about Los Angeles, maybe isn't too keen on the place, and you're talking with them, you know, what, what type of, what elements of history what eras of history what what do you find you you are going to in los angeles history to clarify things for them to help them enjoy or understand los angeles more hmm. well, that's there great to be certain stories you tell a lot that, that's that's what i'm getting at here well well there are um or even now that i think about it you know things that you just point out and say like well that seems this way but it's actually this way or this sort of counterintuitive stuff that comes up to people who are outsiders. I guess I envision, I'm pitching this one to the people who are listening yet have never been here, I suppose. Well, you know, one thing that I, I just I just uh, finished an essay on this um, for an upcoming uh, book project, uh, but I wrote about the Los Angeles street grids, and I think that's something that you can point to, because everybody's familiar with street grids. You don't need to explain what a street grid is. But, you know, Los Angeles has multiple street grids here, um, and they all seem to be at different orientations. DJ Waldy's written a lot about this. Um, and I, I went and I, I tried to look back at the, the origins of them. I mean, we have, we're right now, we're within one of the oldest street grids. Um, it was, it, it sort of evolved from the original Spanish plan for the city, but it was really surveyed and platted by um, a surveyor named EOC Ord in 1847. Um, of Ward Street fame from Chinatown? Yeah, yeah. The street He didn't name the street after himself. It was later named after him. I like, guess usually that's the case, but I would imagine in Los Angeles... His, I would imagine in Los Angeles history, there's a few people naming streets after themselves. Oh, certainly. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the case. Uh, Ord actually named uh, the streets that were, that were here at... We're at... Uh, well, we're at Flower and uh, Fifth. And, I mean, it, it was left up to him to name. And he named Flower, Flower... I think because the street ended in Bunker Hill, which was every spring was covered in. It was ablaze with wildflowers. Some some vivid photos of that exist still, don't they? You know what? I haven't seen any of Bunker Hill with wild, and just because you know Bunk- flowers anyway somewhere. I know I've seen <laughs> I know I've seen pictures of flowers in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the most famous place to to see flowers was right at the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains up uh, in Altadena. Uh, there was actually there was a stop along the Mount Low. A railway called Poppy Fields, and people would get out and just pick poppies on their way up to the Alpine Tavern. Mm. That's a vivid image. <laughs> it is. It's a great photograph too. Some of these streets downtown, you, you, I'll visit. Somebody will be visiting me, and I'll we'll we'll get to downtown, and they'll see these street names, and it'll be like, 
Hmm. Flower Hill, Broadway. These are grand. They're they're like incongruously Anglo names to them. They expect more uh, coangos or more picos or more. They're they're used to. It's 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 like. There's an. It's how how am I going to put this? The normal becomes abnormalized, but it, that's because it was normal back when downtown was something very different, right? Yeah. Well, I mean the the, the streets. It, when when the Americans conquered Los Angeles in 1847, there really weren't many streets. There weren't many well-defined streets. There was a main street or a calle principal, um, and then there were highways that linked Los Angeles to other cities in the region. And the, these were all called El Camino Real. They were El Camino Real Day something. Um, th- there's you know there's the El Camino Real of romantic lore, but um, that never really existed as. Um, it, as what we think of it today, um, it wasn't uh, you know constantly. Uh, there weren't fathers constantly um, walking from mission to mission on it. But you know most of the most of the streets in Los Angeles were named by Americans, and and actually the first ones were named by an American military officer. Although interestingly enough, he named he gave them all bilingual names on his uh, original survey map. Um, he named, for instance, it was Calle de Flores. Um, and Broadway was Fort Street. It was later renamed Broadway. And I don't know... If it, I, I have... Uh, my, my friend Ed Fuentes uh, suggests that maybe there was some sort of a New York connection. Somebody yeah. who pined for New York named, decided to rename Fort Street Broadway. There was also a Brooklyn Avenue, Brooklyn yes, Heights. Yes, yes, yes. Now uh, Cesare Chavez, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. The number of cultures you get in Los Angeles is... it's. It's almost become a cliched thing to talk about. You know, you, you can bring that up to people who are not quite sold on Los Angeles and say, well, there's sort of a microcosm of the world here. You can, maybe more so than anywhere else in America, in America, you can experience a wide variety of cultures here. But I think the more interesting question is how, how those cultures get, and I'm specifically not thinking of absorbed over history, but there's a, this is something that people have long written about, about Los Angeles as well, that um, assimilation doesn't work the same way. It's Los Angeles is not exactly a melting pot. Uh, it's it's not segregated by near physical walls, as some you know some commenters would would say that they, that's uh, that's the problem that was identified in the seventies, eighties, nineties that people were maybe too far apart. But nor do they become one common culture either. Nor are they subsumed into that. What? What does go on with that in Los Angeles history? What's what's different about the way uh, cultures come together here and don't come all the way together? But nor do they nor are they completely separate. Well, I think one of the most interesting examples is um, you know the the first Americans to arrive here. Um, they were most mostly men um, who married into um, wealthy Mexican families um, who converted to Catholicism. Uh, adopted Mexican citizen, citizenship and ultimately inherited, you know, half of Southern California. Um, they, some of them actually sympathized with the native Californians in the Mexican-American War. Uh, most of them were stayed on the sidelines. Some of them, I think, favored the Americans. But there, you know, that, that's an inter- interesting point where um, you have American-born uh, men who fought against their native country or who at least. Opposed their native country in 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 war. It's one of those phenomena that I, I tend to look for a pattern in, like the ways that when when waves of, waves of immigration have sent various cultures here, like how how has each one from even you know, the, the later waves from Mexico and Central America, the Japanese, the Koreans, uh, even Ethiopians or um, Armenians. I look for a pattern in the ways they've engaged with Los Angeles, but it seems like there really isn't a pattern. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, they all did different things. Like some, we we have a Korea town. I live in it. A lot of the people there can only speak Korean uh, still, but the Japanese, for example, they're. They, I mean, there's very few who can't speak English. Most of them were born here now. Hmm. It seems like Los Angeles, to put it another way, is there is no single, there is no single, not just immigrant experience, but no single way that Los Angeles accepts or digests its influences, which has got to make it, it's got to make history more interesting because you've got more to, to, you've got more to learn. There's more, 
you know, it does, never gets predictable, but at the same time, there's it's hard to write an overarching narrative, isn't it? Oh, it is. That's actually something that I. Uh, that's a question I ask myself sometimes: is you know, can, can you write? Can you write an overarching narrative of Los Angeles? Um, and I just, I just listened or just attended a great panel uh, the other day at the West Hollywood Book Fair uh, about reimagining or yeah, reimagining Los Angeles. Um, and David Ulan made a great point that um, sort of the narrative about Los Angeles is that it has no narrative. But I mean, Los Angeles does have many competing narratives um, that. But you're right; they don't work for everyone. I, so I, I have seen people have written books that that try to explain Los Angeles, that try to cover the entire history of Los Angeles. Um, you know, it's not it's not very satisfying. I mean, I don't know if reality really can be. They history. always narrow down to one thing. To, not one thing, but they narrow down to a smaller set of angles, don't they? they, they sure. Even books that begin with ambitions of saying everything always. You can tell what they're interested in at a certain point because if you're interested in all of it, you're paralyzed. You can't you can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. So I think an interesting experiment might be to write to to try to write a narrative of Los Angeles that you know isn't true, that, but you, that that sort of captures um, the popular mythology that exists about the city. I see. One, you're specifically writing. It can't be true, but it does capture the untrue ideas people have about it. The myths. This it's a completely you want to write a completely mythical narrative. Is that the idea? Exactly. And I've never seen anybody try that. It, it'd be interesting because you know most of these myths aren't made explicit. Right. Um, you know they're they're veiled, um, and maybe we can start in a desert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So Los Angeles is a desert. Um, a conspiracy. Various conspiracies provide it with everything it needs well, that's and thing. take away some of the things. The question is: the question is where to start. Do you? I mean, because you know, a lot of narratives about Los Angeles begin, yeah, begin with the aqueduct, or they begin in post-war, you know, post World War II Los Angeles. Uh, they begin with the arrival of the Americans. I mean, how far do you go back? Where do you start if you're trying to construct one of these narratives? Maybe you have to write several of these. Right. Um, some throw their hands up and begin at the Olympics. Because at that point, it, I guess from what I understand, it, the city did feel like a different place in that after that era. The 32 or 84? Oh, good, good point. <laughs> good point after the second Olympics. Okay. Although, okay. why not Why not write one starting at 32 as well? You have a lot of options is the point here. Right. I think the place to start is with some sort of a crime, right? right. Yeah, sure. That's uh, at least with one version of the narrative. Um, so Hopefully a crime that founded Los Angeles. Whatever crime was, the city was built on, crime or crimes, exactly. go from there. Which, you know, in most tellings is going to be the aqueduct. Sure, sure. Okay. There, there's something Rainer Banham, who we mentioned, uh, author of uh, Los Angeles, The Architecture of Four Ecologies, another very widely read Los Angeles book. Um, he said that that's the tricky thing about Los Angeles is almost everything you can say about it is true. It's harder to find completely untrue things because even I make fun of the conspiracy theories, but 10% of a lot of these theories is probably grounded in reality. You know, 10, 20%, 50%. Sure, sure. Yeah, especially for, you know, for instance, the the GM streetcar uh, conspiracy. I mean, sure, the General Motors owned the company that, or at least partially owned the company that purchased the streetcars. I mean, the the final streetcar lines were were closed down after the lines had been transferred back to a, a government agency. Um, so yeah, there's some element of of the truth in in all of that, and it's it's another. There's always another side of something. You, know, you can say. Uh, you can, you can. Th those who bemoan the the loss of the streetcars have they, they have their points, but also, I think I try to put myself in the mind of that time and think, well, I'm in the city of the future. I see these gleaming new expressways going up. Right. Everybody can buy a car now. Right. Everybody I know can buy a car now. Uh, it's downtown to the beach in literally 20 minutes, probably in those days. Uh, I try to think how exciting that would feel. And I find in Los Angeles history, you often have to put yourself back and like, what would have excited people then? What would have seemed really promising? Because now we know all too well the problems with the, the freeway utopia that was built. But you have to know what people were thrilled about or really optimistic about it. What were they thinking the future would look like at any given time, don't you? Sure. I mean, and, and one, you know, one viewpoint that's often overlooked when we're talking about streetcars versus freeways um, is that of women. Um, I mean, women were, uh, for, for women, the automobile offered um, freedom. It offered uh, relatively, I mean, we know the, the danger that automobiles bring, but a relatively safe um, way to get from point to point. I mean, a, a, a lot of women didn't feel comfortable 
in the streetcars. They were, you know, dark. There were usually um, mostly men on there. Um, even today, some, you know, a lot of women don't feel comfortable. And and actually, Robert Post, who's um, he, he's written a lot of history about um, urban transit systems. You know, he looked at the um, sort of the r- rise of nostalgia um, for the the streetcars, and it was mainly driven by uh, rail fans, which are oh, which yes. were overwhelmingly male. Oh, they are overwhelmingly male. That's true. Uh, and, and so, you know, half of the population wasn't being well served by these these streetcars. And these are, you know, they, they those could have been um, those deficiencies could have been fixed. Um, but we're not we're not recognizing that when we when we you know yearn for the days of the the red car the the quick you know yes another perhaps we're getting into the realm of myth then we say well the, the red car yeah, about the capabilities of the and the the desirability of, of that particular transit system we build our own myths you know sure. when, when did he peg that wave of nostalgia as, as happening like as starting is it something that after those got mostly out of living memory or or when no actually i think it, it began in the streetcars uh waning days nice. um you know actually a lot of those rail fans purchased the the cars themselves and that was the genesis of the orange empire railway museum out in paris They're, they actually have a lot of uh, a lot of the old yellow and red cars um that were just bought right off you know on their last day on the line um but it, it you're right once once the lines were discontinued then there was no concrete example to point to say oh this is why we closed them um so it in, you know through their public advocacy they they gained a following I wonder whether optimism, forward-lookingness, or nostalgia have the upper hand right now in Los Angeles. I mean, is, are those forces you can see grappling with each other throughout history? I mean, even Mike Davis has said even when he was a kid in the 50s, people had thought Los Angeles, well, it was once Edenic, and now it's ruined. In the 50s, it's ruined. Mm-hmm. What what can you say about the ways that have... have has, have optimism and nostalgia always just simply coexisted here, or do, or do they really sort of? Is there, there are optimistic times, there are nostalgic times. It seems like those are two powerful forces here in Los Angeles, whether you're telling its story or just sort of living here. Sure, I mean I, I can't say whether they've always coexisted, but it seems like they do. They do coexist at, at points. Um, I mean, in the 1890s, for instance, the uh, there's the uh, La Fiesta uh, celebrations, which at one point looked back and tried you know tried to use the the city's um hispanic past you know and to co-opt it um and tie it into this narrative that was actually um played out physically in a parade um justifying uh the american sum- supremacy in los angeles but you know there were, the la-, la fiesta used um nostalgia while looking forward um and proclaiming Los Angeles as this um, city of the future. I mean, there isn't the uh, isn't the best book on this. Um, uh, William Alexander McClung's um, Landscapes of Desire. It may well be the best. I, you you might be in a better position to know what the best book on this is, but that's that's a, that's a solid choice. Right. Well, because he writes about the two competing mythologies of um, Utopia and Arcadia. Right. Um, imagine even in 1890 somebody was before that even in 1875 somebody was saying how great oh, in 1860 this place wasn't ruined you know what I mean that's there's always somebody doing that and there's always going to be somebody saying we well, yeah, wait wait until 1910 then you'll see then then this will then this will be uh, this we, we will have achieved utopia you know what I mean yeah I, I mean I wonder what I, I can't see the the first settlers, the, the Pobladores, in 1781, saying, "Oh, you know, we've ruined Los Angeles." Uh, I mean, they were. They, I mean, maybe they weren't optimistic. Uh, it wasn't an easy existence. Um, you know, they, along with uh, native inhabitants, you know, built the city um, from scratch. Um, you know, you, we talk about the difficulties of getting an overarching narrative down in, in Los Angeles, and you mention also that. You're, you have a book project in the offing. What can you tell us about that? And is there a, the challenge of an overarching narrative presented by that project? Oh, that's... I, I was just contributing an essay to, to a book project. So you, avoid, you avoided that pitfall. <laughs> exactly. Just an essay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if anybody's able to 
And who can do that? I mean, Kevin Kevin Starr has written a, a one volume history of of California. He hasn't written one of Los Angeles. I'd love to see him do that. Um, I I I'm not aware of any recent histories of overarching histories of Los Angeles. Are you? I'm trying to think of one. That's not doesn't sound like the kind of book people have been wanting to write for a while. You know what I mean? No. But what, I don't, and I don't know if people are clamoring for it. But I wonder what, in the form you write in, in the short form, the short historical form, what what have you gotten the sense people want to hear more about? What do you get feedback about that gives you a read on people's curiosity about about Los Angeles and its history? Hmm. Well, I, I mean, I. The, the best way I can evaluate that is just to, to see what sort of articles seem to strike a chord with people. Right. Um, you know, people love stories about uh, the city's sort of lost geography. That uh, I mean, pe- if, if you... I sometimes just like to look at old maps of Los Angeles and try to put myself in the, the mind of, of that map maker, you know, because this person saw Los Angeles as a completely different place. And if you look at these maps... Um, and the city does look completely different. There are names that you don't recognize. I just wrote something about Colgrove, which was yes. uh, actually which was founded before Hollywood, and it was for for a few decades was Hollywood's chief rival, and then it was eventually absorbed within the city. And today, the name doesn't exist anymore, except uh, you know on historical maps. Um, and then there are you know there are streams, uh, creeks that existed um, that course through what are today. Um, suburban urbanized areas um, people people respond to that uh, you know again because it, it surprises them uh, who, who knew that there was a that there was a stream that crossed Wilshire Boulevard but if you walk down Wilshire Boulevard it's not really it's, it's not easy to tell if you're driving but if you walk down Wilshire Boulevard um, right after you cross the former site of the Ambassador Hotel the street dips down and then it goes back up and that's the former creek bed of uh, I think it's the Arroyo de Sacatela I used to live in a creek bed. I used to live right there. Really? Yes. Wow. I didn't see. This is one of those things. Had I known I lived in a creek bed, my life in that part of Koreatown would have been so much richer. I think. Well, pre- presumably. I mean, what 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 is your? Oh, well, you? I, w- I want to ask you. So, how does that make your life richer? I mean, what, what how does that? Uh, you know, how does that knowledge of of the the past landscape? How does that that really? Well, we can compare notes because I would I would have asked you the exact same thing. Is is when you're just downtown, I mean, so much of the past is visible. So much never got knocked down mm-hmm. that you you really, I mean, even Angel's Flight, which was in a box for 20 years or something like that, was put back up. Reminders are all around, but I, I do think that it's been a pretty linear, maybe even a, a better than linear relationship of the more I know about Los Angeles history or the more I know about, I mean, let's not even get that narrow, the more I know about the nature of Los Angeles, just what exactly the place is, the richer my experience of it, the, the better, the happier I am here. And I mean, I moved here in the first place because I found it to be the most fascinating city in America. So it's not like I was one of these people who dragged myself here because I thought I could be on TV. And then I was like, well, I guess this place is okay, but I don't like this and this and this. I mean, it's, it seems like it is, it's a place I find you don't learn a lot about just by osmosis. You have to be pretty active about learning. And now I would ask you, do you think that's true? But you've, I think you're probably one of the most active about learning about Los Angeles history people that I've met. So you're going to say yes, probably. But I mean, do you think it's a place that, that does require, you've got to put in a little bit more effort to learn about it. There are rewards, but it's not something, I feel like if I lived in New York, I'd be learning more about the place just by kind of being there. You know what I mean? Yeah, but how does that work? I mean, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> You know, I mean, sure, learning more about Los Angeles. I mean, for me, that you know, it requires a lot of time. Uh, you know, look, looking at old newspaper articles, uh, looking at old books. Um, you know, there aren't. There actually are, though. Right down here on on Flower, there are um, those the Angel Walk uh, interpretive. Uh, you can read those signs. That's true. Yeah, I don't see many people stopping to read them. But One by the Ambassador Hotel. It doesn't mention the creek. No, it should though, huh? But no, those are those are wonderfully done. Actually, the one um, at Union Station on the Patsuris, uh Transit Plaza, it does mention the old um, Ella, uh, Ella Lisa, the old sycamore tree. Next time I catch the flyaway, I'm going to be reading that. Yeah, you should. If I get there on time. Yeah, those are those are really well done. But if if you don't stop to look at those, I don't know how you would pick up um, these sort of traces of the past. What, given all you know now about Los Angeles, what what types of 
I mean, what remains, I don't know if I want to say elusive, but what do you want to learn more about in Los Angeles' history? What is, what is, I may, maybe, a, a, do I mean a specific era? Do I mean a specific type uh, aspect of Los Angeles' history? What sort of thing tends to, ten, what, what do you want to learn more about the most, but also what tends to be the hardest to find out? <laughs> Uh, maybe those two are closely entwined. I'm not sure that they are the same. I mean, what what I what I'm always drawn to, and at least maybe it's just <laughs> just a fad of mine. But I, I'm drawn to the the history of our of our trees here, mm. and we're under a nice one and many other nice ones. <laughs> we are. Um, I don't know if I can name. Uh, this is a jacaranda tree right here. Um, I, I couldn't know. have told you that. Yeah. This looks like some sort of a fig tree right here. I'm not. I'm in no way a tree expert, but I've been drawn to the history of of trees in Los Angeles because um, I think. Well, you was know, was it that tree in your front yard? Uh, it could have been that, and and the and the you know ghosts of the orange trees that were cut down and burned. But uh, avenge us, <laughs> right. would never forget. Right, but you know, Los Angeles. Um, most of what what is today Los Angeles was uh, treeless. It was uh, you know. Grasslands, uh, chaparral. Now there were there were uh, riparian ecosystems where there were cottonwoods, willows, sycamores, um, and then you know there were also oak. There were oak trees all around, but um, mo much of what's today Los Angeles didn't have trees, uh, and so what what's here is mostly imported, introduced, and I think what uh, the types of trees that we imported them that, that we imported says a lot about. Us, or at least that moment in Los Angeles history. Um, about the, the way we were when Los Angeles was being invented, essentially, the Los Angeles we know. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, what do I, the trees say about what we wanted here? Well, uh, I mean, if you look to, well, almost all of the trees that we've introduced, uh, or all of the, the most popular trees that we've introduced, um, whether they're pepper trees, um, palm trees, um, you know, Morton Bay fig trees are also, um, I mean, they, they're common, they're not as common as those. Um, eucalyptus trees, the, the blue gum trees, uh, they're all evergreens. Um, and so, you know, that definitely reinforced the notion that Los Angeles was this, um, this paradise where uh, maybe it required a little bit of work, but you could turn turn it into whatever you wanted. And now we have the myth of no seasons. Exactly. Yeah, and that's, if, if, if you, uh, right in front of the building where I work, Doheny Library, there's, uh, uh, there's several sycamore trees, and right now they're losing their, their leaves. They lose their, their leaves every year. Right. You're right. Um, if, if we had chosen to plant native um, sycamore, now oaks, a lot of the, the coast live oaks are evergreen, of course, but if we planted native sycamore trees or, or deciduous trees from, from back east, you're right, that myth wouldn't exist. Okay. We are living with the choices of people of a certain era, the legacy of many choices made a long time ago here. It's something people, I, I would say, don't usually realize, but a lot, a lot of the stuff was decided upon um, quite a few generations ago by a certain set of people, right? Oh, sure, yeah, and it's... Uh, and, and, you can go back to street grids too. Those are um, those are remarkably resilient. Um, I I recently uh, did a little bit of research on an 1886 uh, aerial photograph of Los Angeles. It was uh, taken from a balloon about 9,000 feet above the city. Um, Another very 19th century America thing to do: go ballooning and photograph. Yeah, exactly. And there's an amusing story behind the uh, the creation of the photograph too. There was a Basically, the San Francisco newspaper wars were brought down here. There was some, there were accusations of sabotage because the, the the balloon was sent up by the San Francisco Examiner, and uh, p uh, folks from the Chronicle uh, were suspected of of sabotaging the balloon. And this is the most nineteenth century America story ever. Is there a guy going over a waterfall in a barrel too, or something, some <laughs> contraption, or a, a mechanical Turk, or something? Well, well, we don't have many waterfalls here, but um, as long as it was happening somewhere. Yeah, exactly, Niagara Falls. Um, the, uh, the the photo shows the you know the photo shows streets and buildings um, and then I after after I uh, had filed my story I, I went into um, Google Earth and I decided to try to reproduce that that image and um, if you put the two images side by side I mean it's just remarkable how the the streets all you know the the, the buildings have, have changed Bunker Hill has been completely regraded but right. the street grid is the same right. I mean nothing it, nothing built is the same. Everything underneath is the same. Exactly. Yeah.
Now, what's the hardest type of thing to find out about Los Angeles? You mentioned what was your, you said what you like learning about the trees. I imagine tree information is not that hard to come by, but what ends up being a challenge in Los Angeles history? Well, uh, I mean, I think it's probably true of all history is, is um, ordinary people, you know, an exceptional people, people who didn't non, have non captains of industry. Yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, little known fact: most people are not captains of industry here in Los Angeles, or they were not then, and are not. I don't know, movie producers today, whatever the equivalent is of captains of industry. Exactly. Um, so that's the challenge, and that's that's probably one of the big challenges of, of writing an over, overarching narrative of Los Angeles. If you're trying to be true to, to history, is to to include include people, especially, I mean, entire communities have been excluded from the historical record. Um, so that, that would be a challenge. Now, by writing short pieces, I, I can avoid those pitfalls. Right, but you do get a pointillist portrait at some point. A lot of short pieces do make the history. Uh, a history? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's a coherent history. Sure. Um, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not into Los Angeles history because I like coherence. I don't think you are either. No, no. Uh, <laughs> Well, so then I guess that, I guess that that um, yeah. So you're you're right because I um, I feel like you could read a lot of short pieces of, of history and, and feel like you have a greater understanding of the history without of the city's history without really having any I, I without having a great way to explain how everything came together and how how we are at this moment in time. I've been speaking today at the uh, McGuire Gardens at the Downtown Central Library in Los Angeles with Nathan Masters, whose writing you can read at KCET and at Los Angeles Magazine. He writes on behalf of, by the way, Los Angeles as subject, who have, I mean, they have a lot on their website. What can, what can, what can listeners find from Los Angeles as subject online? Well, well, well the greatest thing that, that uh, Elliot Subject has on its website is uh, it's a directory of uh, research uh, resources, of um, archives, uh, libraries, um, it, it's uh, it's all searchable. So if you're doing any sort of a research project, um, or if you just really want to, you know, genealogical research, you just want to find out more about any particular subject, type type in a few keywords, um, and you'll be directed to um, you know the the best sources. Okay. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andrzej Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Blosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, Nick Weigelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.